every time I talk about physical habits and I bring up things, I, I put things on the table. Oh, I put alcohol, I put beer, I put cigarettes. Um, I put a bunch of stuff. That's the only ones I can remember. Um, oh, I put, you know, I talk about pride, put different things, just all kinds of, you know, uh, some things I didn't put on the table like gluttony. You know, gluttony, all of us have taken part in that. Not just with food, but gluttony with getting too much of something that we just know it's not good for us. And um, gluttony is a terrible thing. Laziness, God talks about slothfulness. Laziness is a terrible thing. And if anything, we're living in a nation that has become lazy and become very, very like gluttons. And these are physical habits that are terrible. And I, uh, there's some people that get really ticked off. And, you know, in the past, there's been a lot of people that have, won't come to this church because I talk about alcohol. I want you to know a drunk driver, when Tammy was 15 years old and she was driving with somebody else, a drunk driver hit that car and killed that driver, that, the car that she was in, threw her in the back seat. And um, <clears throat> she had to kick out a window. And back in the day when there was no cell phone, she went, ran from house to house to house. A drunk driver almost took out my wife. And drinking, there's nothing good that comes out of drinking, as far as I'm concerned. And, and it's funny, if it ticks you off when I talk about drinking, that means you got a problem. That means you got a problem. And uh, people that have left this church because of drinking, they don't want to come because I talk about drinking. Well, Bible talks about drunkenness. And I'm not going to not talk about it if the Bible talks about it. Talks about drunkenness. You know, um, will, a, will a cup of wine take me to hell? A cup of wine for me? You might be picking me up off the floor. Let's say a little sip or a, that much of a, a cup of wine. No, it won't take me to hell. It won't do nothing to me. But if my children are watching, now I become a stumbling block. Do you realize again that when we become a stumbling block, the Bible says that that is a worse sin than the act of drinking itself or the act of gluttony or the act of bitterness or the act of adultery. To become a stumbling block is a terrible sin that God says he will hold us accountable and um, that will take us to a place called hell. And I mean, this stuff is serious, serious stuff with God. We talked about these physical habits. There's tons of physical habits, but... Um, you know, and I put it all together in a sheet and threw it in the trash bin. And that's what God does in our lives. He cleans our slates. But habits form in our lives that we can't allow form to form. We have to fight against these habits that want to overtake us. And then I want to talk about this, and I say this. Your mental state triggers emotional habits. God is all about our mental state. He's about renewing our minds. Our minds affect our emotions, and our emotions af start affecting our habits. And this is something that um, we have to take and put, put in control of the Lord, especially after this last year. And so, I've asked Elena. Elena, if you could come and join me. Give it up for Elena. <clears throat> Elena is a clinical social worker, and I've used Elena different times to help me out when, when it comes to things like this. And also, Elena has been uh, helping me out, counseling people here at the church, or even people on the outside, they come in and get counsel from Elena. Um, She's awesome. She's excellent. Uh, 
what gives her the ability when she helps me counsel people here is uh, she's able to use the word of God and become like a Christian counselor here. She may not be able to, she, she's not able to do that at work. You work for Mc, McLaren. Flint. Yeah, McLaren and Flint. And uh, but she's been there for 30 years and she's been helping us out at least over 15 years. Um, one thing I learned a long time ago, I'm a shepherd, I'm not a counselor. I, in fact, if anything, I coach people, I mentor people. But I, I don't, when, it, when you learn, when you know what, what you need to be, and when you learn what you should be, uh, that is so important in your life. Um, you know, and a lot of pastors try to do all the hats. No, I just want to shepherd you. I want to pastor you. That's why I've asked Lena years ago to help counsel. Uh, she's a professional in this area. Not me. Um, she does this day in, day out for hours. Um, she couldn't be the shepherd. I'm the professional shepherd to serve God's people as God's under shepherd. So I learned of this a long time ago, and it's like it relieved a big burden off of me. And, um, and so she does an incredible job. It's a very private thing if anybody does want um, or, or if you know of anyone, or marriages, or your, your skill level is like, a, you deal a lot with young people, is that? I know you deal with all right. ages. I specialize with adolescents, but I do all ages. Yeah, you do all ages. But I encourage you to call the office. Uh, Elena doesn't report back to me, nothing like that. It's very private. And so uh, I just encourage you with that, because we're living in a day where we just need encouragement. We need to encourage each other. But Elena, um, have you had to deal with more than unusual cases during this pandemic? Um, I was doing some research on that, and it's very interesting. From um, January 2020 to June 2020, there was a 93% increase in mental health diagnosis. 93. That's, those are astronomical yeah. numbers. Um, I've seen them personally in, in the clinic where I work, but also just at the church, I have been very busy. I know. <laughs> you're, you're all, your calendar is always full. Right. 93%. That's, I, I bet we've never seen that. America has never seen that. You see a lot of that with adolescents too because there's such an isolation piece with where they're at home. They can't get out. They can't be around friends. They can't be in their sports. They can't, there's so many restrictions with that and you see a lot of that with adolescents. Um, do our habits affect our brain and in what we think and do? So Pastor was talking a little bit about habits, and we are really creatures of habit, and same thing in our brains. So we create these neural pathways in our brains, and we, we go that same path each time when we respond. So if you are a person who tends to talk maybe negatively <clears throat> about yourself and you make a mistake, oh, I'm so stupid, I can't believe I just did that. You know, you tend to be somebody we never, who... We never do that. <laughs> Don't do it, but I'm just saying, <laughs> sometimes we do. Yeah, we do. <laughs> and uh, so you create those, and um, you go to those. Those are your go-to things. And you can create new pathways. It's been proven in studies that you can create new ones, and you can change habits. We've all maybe changed habits before. But it's interesting, they can actually prove that in your brain, and it'll actually, the neurotransmitters will start to... Um, use synopsis and start going in different directions and start moving. It's just very fascinating to me. And um, what happens is that the, uh, uh, some of the chemicals that fight depression and anxiety and mental health issues start to um, re-engage in a more um, faster capacity. They're more um, quick to respond to some of the things that you have going on versus maybe some of the things that were going on before. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Uh, during this pandemic, a lot of people are dealing with fear, anxiety, uh, you know, the fear of getting the virus, uh, fear to be around people, fear to go to church. Uh, can you share any exercises that, we, that can help us have good emotional habits to combat fear and anxiety and these, these things? It's important that we recognize that the fear is inside our head. So one of the best things you can do is to get outside of your head if that makes sense. So do something. 
Um, if you're not comfortable being in a public place, maybe people that are online or even people going to stores, or if you're at that spot, um, go outside in nature. Go take a walk. Pay attention to what's going on around you. And it's very, there's been so many studies with um, nature that can help you. And use your five senses. You know, your, um, what does it smell like when you're outside? What are you noticing? What do you feel? Maybe pick up some snow, or what do you feel? A bark of a tree, or, you know, pay attention to what everything is around you. You will find that you're outside of that. And, and also, you can do some um, visualization. If you're somebody who is unable to go outside um, to be able to leave your house, maybe because of illness, you can do some visualization and visualize yourself somebody. Personally, I go to Hawaii. <laughs> because that's where I'm going to be. sit back and... Right. <laughs> but I, I use the same technique, though. You do the five senses. You're, my feet are in the sand. I get in almost as if the more you get into it, you can almost smell the water. You know, you can hear the waves coming in. And, and it puts you in a different spot, and it really lowers your, it lowers your blood pressure. It um, slows your breathing down. They're good techniques. Yeah. Um, we're living a day of technology, uh, our phones, um, any habits with these things? Okay, so I'm going to go light of phones, okay? Because light isn't bad. God made light, right? Right. So um, the sun is our biggest piece of light that we have. And it is good, but you light know... Light and it's awesome. It's not up all the time. Right. It's sometimes not up. And that's how our phones should be, or electronics because it still emits the same lights, the blue lights that stimulate our brain. So what happens is if you are doing things later at night and your, the, your computer is on or whatnot, and it thinks the sun is still up, it's not going to release the melatonin that you need in your brain to be able to help you to fall asleep. So now you're trying to fall asleep and you can't because your brain thinks it's still daytime. And the same thing goes with the neurotransmitters that are in your brain. It kind of gets a little messed up. Not sure. You need to be on a, it's called a circadian rhythm. You need to be on a regular rhythm where your body knows when it's up and when it's down. And so then those neurotransmitters like serotonin, dopamine, those kind of things. And those are things that are prescribed in medication for antidepressants, anxiety. And, but you can do it naturally. You know, when you exercise, that's a natural release of those things. Um, you can um, go out in sunlight. That's a natural release of that. Um, laughter is a natural release of that. Um, oh, I love to laugh. So good. Oh, it is, don't you feel good when you have a good belly laugh? Oh, it's so good. We don't laugh enough. Right. Yeah. But the light, you know, it's so easy. Um, and I have to break that habit of I use my phone for my alarm. But then I go to set it at night, and I'm looking at it, and I go to set it, Oh, let's go see over here what's going on over here. Then I, next thing I know, 30 minutes later, uh -huh. you know, and th that light, yeah, it, it does. Then I, then I lay there wondering why I can't go to sleep. You yeah. just overstimulated your brain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that is so true because God, the only light God gave us is the sunlight. And it, there's, uh, there's a time for that and, and time for darkness. Right. Right. So... And, you know, don't forget about um, acts of kindness with people. That's getting out of your own head, too. Do something kind. And it could be just a text. You know, you don't have to have money to be able to do that. Those are just random. Or just say something nice to somebody. Hold a door open for somebody. Mm -hmm. um, being grateful every morning. Waking up and saying gratitudes of what, um, what your day, what your life is like. I would, I didn't ask you this in first, but I would dare say, if some people can't handle social media because it's stirring up a lot of emotions, they probably need to get off of it. There needs to be limits on what we expose ourselves to. Yeah. Yeah. You wouldn't stay in a tornado, I hope. <laughs> and that's a good <laughs> illustration. Give it up for Elena. Thank you so much, Elena. Awesome. Um, I'm going to share just real quick some surveys that have been um, been taken during this time. Thanks, guys. During this time with um, this whole year, after this whole year of Corona virus, the pandemic, things like this. Um, 
really interesting, and um, you, you as the church is going to like this. Uh, do our habit, well, I'm sorry, health and health care survey reveals that only 34% of Americans consider their mental health as excellent. Only 34%. This is the lowest reported number since the survey was first conducted in 2001. Now, are you ready for this? The only demographic, are you ready? All right, I want you to get, get this. The only demographic subgroup who didn't, who did not report a decline in mental health were those who attend church services weekly. We're good. <laughs> We're not mental cases. Woohoo! The only, this is a secular survey. Some of them were uh, Christian surveys, but there's a bunch of articles on that because they've been taking all these studies. Just like Elena said, 93, I think you said, 93% of mental health cases have gone up. God knew what he was talking about years ago, thousands of years ago. I read it to you last week in Hebrews when Hebrews says, don't stop bringing yourself together as the church of Jesus Christ. Let the church be the church. He not only said that so we would worship him, he said that so we could stay healthy mentally. He knows what he's talking about. He knows what we need, amen? He knows he's created us. He knows what we need. And man, the devil is trying to shut down the churches. The devil is trying to shut down the doors. The devil is trying to keep us from fellowshipping. The devil is trying to keep us as a family. It brings health to us. It gets us back on track. We need the interaction. Even some of you men, men are worse in this case. Even some of you men that are like, you know what, I don't like being around a lot of people. I don't like being around crowds of people. That's what my pole barn's for. I go out in my pole barn, and I'm all by myself in my pole barn. Well, God bless you. But guess what? You can only handle that for so long. You need the men's group. You need a good uh, brother in the Lord to go out and breakfast with. Uh, you need a good brother in the Lord uh, to, pray or, to pray over you or you will pray over them. God has created us that way. God has created us with fellowship. This survey doesn't surprise me that the churchgoers are the ones that aren't dealing with mental health problems. Man, the church, you know, you would think the world would finally wake up you know, there's something about church. There's something about worshiping a God, a, whatever they want to call it, a supreme God that is bigger than you. You better believe it. His name's called Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen? <laughs> Amen. <clears throat> I want to go on on some of the, I want to go back to that statement I gave you earlier. Your mental state triggers emotional habits. Probably... The number one thing, and you got some of you are going to have to spend a while thinking about this, but probably the number one thing that your mental state triggers emotional habits is pride. Pride. Why pride? I'm going to need to illustrate it with this robot vacuum cleaner. <laughs> Tammy and I got this for Christmas. And um, when I said I got it for Christmas, she goes, wait a minute. My name was on that tag. Your name wasn't on that tag. And the kids got it, gave it to Tammy for Christmas. Well, she hates technology. So I set it up, and um, it's a shark robot vacuum cleaner, man. It has the, the um, camera on top, you know. And the big thing about these things 
is you just need to let it go. Oh, it takes off and boom, 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 boom. I mean, it's hitting chairs, it's hitting walls, it's, it's going all over the place. And the important thing is it needs to go through your whole home to map out your house. And then all of a sudden it goes up on a map and, uh, or your app and it shows a map of your house. And man, the first map of my house, I'm like, what house were you in? Man, were you drunk or what? And then it says thumbs up or thumbs down if that's your, I'm like, no way. I mean, this goes on five times, 10 times, 15 times. And, um, and finally, I'm, I'm looking up and I'm doing the research and I'm like, what is the deal with these sharks? How many times does it need to go through your house to get a map? And it says, oh, at least 10 times. I'm like, I'm on my 25th time letting this thing go around and try to get a map. And the whole purpose of getting a map, and finally, finally, I got a map that resembled our house, and I put a thumbs up. I got the map because the whole thing is now you start restructuring, you start structuring the map according to your house. Okay, here's bedroom one, here's um, bedroom two, here's the kitchen, here's the lobby or the foyer, here's the you know, living room, you know, things like that. And you just start telling it um, where the rooms are. Because when then the next time you push clean, it throws up all the rooms. So it gives you the opportunity to uh, clean one room, two rooms. Say, I just want to clean the bedroom. Push the bedroom, push clean. Now you stand back and you watch and you think, because the bedroom's over there, and you think it's going to go over there. But no, this stupid thing goes to the living room and cleans the living room. And it's going where it wants to go. And then I'm like, okay, maybe it just needs time to still learn the map. We're on our 26th time now. And, and so I pushed it again. Okay, clean the kitchen. It goes to the bedroom and cleans the bedroom instead of the kitchen. And, and finally, I'm like, you're an idiot. You ever talk to machines? <laughs> you ever kick machines? I mean, I'm like, you're an idiot. Look at me. Go to the bedroom. The bedroom is that way, you know, looking at the camera. And uh, I'm now starting to look like a fool, you know? And, and finally, I tell it to go back to the bedroom. And, and, and finally, it, it works. It, I'm like, it's going to the bedroom. It's going to the bedroom. And all of a sudden, right, you know, it has to pass the bathroom. And I'm like, eh, it goes in the bathroom. <laughs> and it starts to clean the bathroom. And then it cleans another room. Then it decides to go to the bedroom. Aren't we like that? God says, I have mapped out a perfect map for your life. Before you were born, I knew you. I created you. Jeremiah says, I knew you in the womb. I've mapped out your life for you. And so when I tell you to go here, guess what people do? They go over here. Why do they go over there? They know better. They think they know better than God. So God says, do this. No, I'm going to do that. God says, no, 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 go over here. Jonah, go to Nineveh. Huh? I'm not going to Nineveh. I'm going to Joppa. He's going to Joppa. And we're no different. And it's called pride. Because we are control freaks. Some of you look to your mate and look to this person. No, you're a control freak. No, you're a control freak. We're all control freaks, and it's called pride. Pride is the number one thing that finally takes us places we don't belong. And then when you get there, then you wonder why you got problems. Then you wonder why you have issues in your marriage. Then you wonder why you have issues in the family. 
Why didn't I just listen to God? Why didn't I listen to God? I want you to understand something. 23 years ago, when God called us here, and I knew that God finally called us here, I did not want to come here. I was crying the blues. Because I've had people come to me and say, Pastor, I've just got an awesome job that is going to be paying me triple than what I'm getting paid right now. I got an awesome, awesome opportunity. What should I do? Well, what do you feel God's telling you? I haven't asked him yet. Ask him! They're wanting me to say, take it because it's a lot of money. That's not why we go where God tells us to go, because of money. And 23 years ago when God called me here, I never forget, I was sitting in the back yard with my parents there in Mount Morris, and I loved where I was at. Tammy and I loved where we were at. We loved the school system. We loved how our kids were involved in the school system. We loved the church. We loved everything about that area. And as I was um, as I was sitting there with my parents and telling them, I, I, I believe, and I'm crying. And I'm saying, God's called me to Emily City, and I hate it. I don't want to go to Emily City. You know, it's, I don't, I, there's nothing there. I don't want to go to Emily City. Our kids are in the school system. I mean, you know, they're, they're so much in the school system that uh, the principal called me up and said, hey, I know what your home stands for. I know the, the, the character of your heart. And so I want you to know your kid cussed in the recess time. And so I just want you to know it. That's a good principle. I want you to know it because I know that's not what you guys stand for. And I'm like, oh, and I won't tell you who that son is. He sat right there for service. I don't see him right now. David. <laughs> he cussed at somebody in fourth, at third or fourth grade. I don't know. And the, you know, who knows why? But I'm like, God, this is comfort zone. This is awesome. This is great. Why are you taking me? I don't want to go. And Tammy did not want to go. But we heed the call. God said, you go. We could not rationalize it. I want you to understand something. If we would not have come here, we would have lost, I know for sure, we would have probably lost Dave, Pastor Dave. He would have ended up being a drug dealer. Honest. He would have, the way things were going there, now that we look back, I, I feel like we would have lost probably most of our children, and I don't think all of them would have ended up in the ministry. The important thing to me wasn't the ministry, but losing Jesus. Right. And coming here, even through the trials, the persecution, and every junk that was thrown at us here, Emily City has been the greatest thing for our family. I want you to understand that. I mean, we love Emily City. And I only say that I use that because we were fighting the whole way here. God knows better. God knows better. Get out of robot mode. When God says go there, you go there. He's mapped out your life. He's mapped out your marriage. He's mapped out your family. And it's so very important to understand because it, if we don't, pride is going to dictate bad emotional habits in our lives. 
The Apostle Paul, he experienced with God the issue of pride. This is long, but I, I want to read this, and I, I want you to really get a hold of this in 2 Corinthians 12, 7. I will say this, Paul saying, because these experiences I had were so tremendous. Paul was having revelations, miracles that were happening, but they were so great. God was afraid I might be puffed up by them. I might get prideful. So I was given a physical condition. Some other versions say I was given a gift of a handicap. I was given a physical condition which has been a thorn in my flesh. God sent a messenger, a demon from Satan to hurt and bother me and prick my pride because it all had to do with pride. Three different times I begged God to make me well again because it was a physical condition. Each time he said, no, but I am with you. That is all you need. My power shows up best in what? Weak people. Now I am glad to boast about how, how weak I am. I am glad to be a living demonstration of Christ's power instead of showing off my own power or abilities since I know it is all for Christ's good. I am quite happy about the thorn. And he is saying, I'm quite happy about the physical handicap and about insults. I'm happy about hardships. I'm happy about persecution. I'm happy about difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The less I have, the more I depend on him, Jesus Christ. Would Paul had been messed up by pride if God did not give him that thorn in the flesh? Absolutely. God knows best. He saw ahead. He knew. And see, Paul, he was happy about it because he realized that this, this life is nothing but a, a mist, the Bible says. It's a steam. It's here and it's gone. But eternity is eternity. Eternity lasts forever. Paul knew that, and that's why he was happy. God, I'm yours. You're, you know my map better than I know it. Do what you may. Thank you for looking ahead. He accepted it. Thank you for looking ahead because I don't want to be puffed up. I don't want to be prideful because pride, God knows, can mess people up. Pride, like this robot, it gets off track when God says, you go there, and that robot goes here. Paul would have taken a different road, just like Jonah. Jonah, when he went to another city instead of the city that God called him to, God said, you go to Nineveh. Uh -uh. I know better than you, God. He went to Joppa. He gets on a boat, and finally the waves start crashing the boat. He goes to the captain and says, throw me overboard. Now, who says that? Throw me overboard. The plane's going down. Throw, get me out of here. Unless you're messed up in the head. Unless you're depressed. Unless you're, you're mentally messed up. Guess what? He was mentally messed up because he went the wrong way. He went his way. Pride. And finally, the captain threw him overboard and God's grace showed up a fish, swallowed him, spit him up on the seashore. And God said, I love you, Jonah. Just go where I tell you to go, or I'll have another fish swallow you again. Just go where I tell you to go. And when Jonah finally went where God told him, victory showed up. People got saved. God's kingdom flourished. That's what happens in our lives. But God, just like Paul, God wants us to may remain weak. Isn't that funny? That's, a, that's the opposite from what the world tells us. Don't be weak. Be confident in yourself. You know, be strong in yourself. Don't be strong in yourself. 
be weak. Let God be strong through you. Man, when God shows up in your life and you're obeying God's direction, woo, your conscience is clear. Paul said that. Paul says, my conscience is good. It's clear. Is your conscience clear? It's a good place to be when your conscience is clear. When your conscience is clear, you're doing that which pleases God. You know, I look back on this last week. It's miserable, the things that happened this last week. January 6th is going to stay on the calendar in our minds for a long, long time. It was ridiculous what happened this last week. I don't care if it was BLM. I don't care what group it was, if it was the Republican group, which I don't call them the Republican group. They're just a bunch of either desperate people that lost it, just lost it. You know, nobody should condone that. It was wrong, but it happened, and it scarred our nation. And it really, it, it scarred the conservative movement. Now it looks like Joe Biden is getting in. January 20th. Can you be a Democrat and go to heaven? Absolutely. But they have a different agenda. I don't have to tell you. You get on Facebook, you get on social media, you hear it in the news. It's going to be a very different agenda. The Democratic Party now owns the Senate, the Congress. You know it all, I know it all. I've had people come to me and say, Pastor, I am so anxious. I am so fearful. Pastors are, senior pastors are texting me right and left saying, what is going to go on now for the church? Because you know the Democratic Party always has, always will. They're coming after the church. The things that how I preach, I would be considered a hater. And I would be thrown in prison for hate crimes. And that's what they're going to be doing. It looks very dark. I got on my face before God the next day. And I said, Lord, you have forsaken us. I called God out. He's a big God. He can take it. And the whys are okay. And I said, God, why have you forsaken us? What's going on here? And I said that for a long, long time. And all of a sudden, God said, did I not build Gateway during the worst economic time in history? Did I not build Gateway during a Democratic reign of an Obama administration? My church is alive and well and will do good in these years. <clears throat> and he told me, and I am like, you're right, God. And I got up and I just started praising. I just started, well, why am I saying why, God? It is your church. Jesus is alive. He is alive. And that means his church is alive. And that means his church maybe needs to start walking by faith and not by sight. His church needs to get on their knees more and start praying and praying and praying. Daddy, you need to start praying for your family that you have forsaken. Mama, you need to start praying for Daddy, your, your, your husband, that he will be the man of God that God has mapped out for him that has called him to be. And guess what? Amen. And guess what? That might not be like you think, lady. That might not be like you want, lady. You let him be that him be what God has called him to be. His personality is different than your personality. But then you let her be what she needs to be. You just pray for each other so your family remains righteous and holy before God. We need to pray. We need to pray. And don't put it past God that God is saying, no, no, no. I gave you four years of prosperity. Now it's time, church, to get on your knees because you have forsaken me. I haven't forsaken you. Jesus says, I, I won't forsake you. I'll be with you to the ends of the earth. Ends of the earth. But understand, we finally needed to tell the anxiety, tell the fear, get out of here. My, my mind, my eyes aren't on a man. 
It's not about Donald Trump. It's not, not about the conservative party. Jesus, it's about you. What you need to do for America, you map it out. You know what you need to do. I said yesterday in closing of our prayer time, I told, used Aaron um, McIntosh as an example because he just got married. And I said, and that was a crazy, crazy, uh, not the wedding, but right before the wedding, so many people thought they had the virus and they were getting tested in their, in their wedding clothes. And I mean, all, it was just crazy. It was just a crazy day. And um, I told Aaron, he was, him and Grace were there. Where, are they here right now? Oh, right over there. I told Aaron, I said, Aaron, man, there was nothing that was going to hold you back from getting your bride that day, right? That's right. Because he was going to Cancun. He was leaving. That's all that was on his mind was, man, my honeymoon. And you know, you remember that, men, don't you? That was just on his mind. Nothing, no coronavirus or anything. I don't care if she's a test positive or what. <laughs> we're going to be sick together because you were, you were going for it, right? Great, you had grace on your mind. Jesus has his church on his mind. You know, understand that Jesus doesn't know the time or day. Or the hour. He's anxious. He's saying, God, God, I am ready. I am ready. I am ready. And the Bible says that these things got to get a little bit darker in this world before Jesus comes back to get his bride. And Jesus is anxious. And don't put it past God that finally prosperity days are over. And some of you are like, oh, that's just too bad. No, no, no. Get your eyes on God. You don't live for this life. You live for God. You live for God. And man, and Jesus is anxious for his bride. We're, we're his bride. Christ's followers are his bride. And the Bible says in the last days that he's going to weed out his church. Do you realize that the new stats uh, that they're telling the churches that 20% aren't going to come back after this pandemic is over? 20% of the church is not going to come back. Why? He's weeding out his church. He's saying, who is for me and who's against me? Moses said it to the children of Israel. Who's for me and who's against me? Jesus is going to say it. He goes, you know what? You're not, a, you're not for me? Then get on the left side where the goats are. I want the ones on the right, the sheep. I want the ones that are following me, that are, that are eager for me, that, are, that loves me. I, I, I'm for them. And he's coming back for that bride. And, he, and the Bible says he's going to weed it out in the last days. So understand, keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. Don't let your pride get ahead of you. Real quick, the mental state triggers emotional habits through guilt. People go through all kinds of guilt. Judas went through a guilt like no other when he realized what he did. He realized that he, that he gave up Jesus Christ for just a few pieces of silver. And as he gave up, guilt literally controlled his life. And what did he do with that guilt? That emotional habit of guilt, it killed him. He committed suicide. We have the apostle Peter. Peter denied Jesus three times. Cursed Jesus' name, cursed Jesus' name, cursed Jesus' name. The cock crowed. All of a sudden, he realized what he did. Guilt flooded his mind. He didn't go run into the cross, which he should have when Jesus was crucified. He should have gone run into the cross. He didn't go run into the cross. He went back to his old ways. He went back to that which God called him out of. God says, you're not going to be a fisherman, but you're going to be a fisher of men. I have called you to be an evangelist. I've called you to be a pastor. I've called you to be a missionary. I haven't called you to be a fisherman. He went back to being a fisherman because of his guilt. I can only imagine Peter was saying, God, I just cursed, betrayed, denied the son of God. God's never going to use me again. God, God probably doesn't even love me anymore. Guilt has a way of driving us to a point 
where we're like, God, you can't forgive me. You can't forgive me. And all of a sudden, he's out there fishing. And Jesus shows up on the shoreline. And Peter says, that's Jesus. Somebody yelled out, Jesus. He jumps in clothes and everything, jumps in, swims to the shoreline. Jesus was already cooking some fish for lunch. This was after the resurrection. And he looked at Peter and said, Peter, do you love me? And he says, you know I love you. And Jesus said, then feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? You know I love you. Then feed my lambs. Peter, do you love me? You know I love you, Christ. Then feed my sheep. He did it three times to reinstate, to let Peter repent. Three times. He's looking for our repentance. He's looking for our repentance. Guilt drives us places we don't belong. God says, go to the cross, robot. And the robot goes to the places you don't belong because of your guilt. And Peter, if it wasn't for the love of Jesus, see, when you know Jesus loves you so much, he loves you so much. I'm telling you, if you looked at some pornography and you're addicted to pornography and that's all you do every day, you, you, you say, oh, God, help me. Next day, you're just addicted, addicted to these chat rooms, addicted to, I mean, prostitutes. I mean, I, I've heard it all. I mean, you're just addicted. God loves you. He loves you. But see, your guilt will tell you different. He loves you. He loves you so much. Do you know, realize who's ever addicted to those things? Do you realize that he's right there while you're doing it? He loves you so much. His right hand, Psalms 139 says, will never leave you. It will lay on your shoulder. You can try to find the farthest way away from me. And he says, I'm always right there because I love you. But your guilt tells you different. But when you repent, and Peter had to repent three times because he denied Jesus three times. And all of a sudden, the third time, he said, oh, I love you so much, God. And his guilt was gone. I have this for you. Don't let your guilt dictate who you are but let his love show you who he wants you to be. When he loves you, when you know he loves you so much, just say, God, I'm sorry. It's gone. It's gone. See, Satan wants to keep you in that prison of guilt. But don't stay there. Just know that Jesus loves you so much. Your mental state triggers emotional habits through regret. Philippians 3.13 says, brothers, sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, straining, straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which, Christ, which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. You see how it says, I'm straining. I'm straining because Paul said, I am the chief of sinners. I am the biggest sinner that has ever been alive on planet earth. That's what Paul said. Paul realized he could live with regrets, but he is saying, uh-uh, I have given my heart to Jesus Christ. It's behind me. My sins are behind me. They're not going to torment me anymore. They're behind me. My guilt's behind me. My regret's behind me. It's done. And I'm going to strain. And it is a strain because see that regret wants to haunt you at times. And you keep straining and straining. And he goes, I focus on the prize. The prize is what we're focusing on. It's not the prize of gold of men. It's not the prize of your bank account. It's the prize of Christ Jesus 
heaven bound I want to be. How about you? It's straining towards. Man, we want to be heaven bound. When that day comes, we can say goodbye and go to heaven. And Paul understood that because he regrets hold us back from the prize. Guilt hold us back, holds us back from the prize. It keeps us in our own little prison cell. He says, I strain towards that prize. That's what I love about when I gave my heart to Jesus Christ, my slate was clean. Oh, and all I saw was a new future ahead of me, a new future ahead of me. Now, are there things, consequences that happen when you're sinning? Yeah. It's like Pastor Dave said Wednesday night. I had an awesome Wednesday night message to our young people in here. And he said, hey, there are consequences. Men, if you get a men before marriage, if you get a lady, a young, or your girlfriend pregnant, um, hey, deal with it. There's consequences because of our sin. But don't live in that regret. I could give you person after person after person that had fell into that sin and that has had victory in the name of Jesus Christ because they strained towards the prize in Jesus Christ. I, man, look at Terry that I just told you about. At 40 years old, he finally gave his heart to Jesus. Him and Janice got remarried, and man, victory hit their home and hit their marriage. No regrets. It's behind. Don't let it dictate in that habit. Your mental state triggers emotional habits through insecurities. Man, when I think of insecurities, I think of Gideon. Gideon, here God, the angel of the Lord shows up to Gideon, and Gideon is talking to himself, saying, no, I'm the run of the litter. There's nothing good that happens to me. And finally, the angel of the Lord said this, in uh, Judges 6, 14, the Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have. Save Israel out of Midian's hands, the enemy's hands. Am I not sending you? This is the Lord speaking. But Lord, Gideon asked, and get this, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. He was just focused on himself. And, and God was saying, you can't save Israel, but I can through you. Get weak. Become weak so he can become strong in your life. And here, Gideon, finally when he realized and he took himself out of the equation, and he finally realized it's not about me, but I'm going to step out in faith and I'm going to get a hold of God. I'm going to get a hold of my Lord because it's through him that things are going to happen. All of a sudden, he took 32,000 men of Israel that went down to, I think, 11,000. And then 11,000 went down to 300 men. And Gideon is still full of faith. Gideon is still strong in faith. He goes, we're going to do this. You know that 135,000 enemy men? I don't know how we're going to do it, but we're going to do it through God. And those 300 men had victory, and they killed every one of the enemy, 135,000. Insecurities hold us back. But God says, just become weak so I can make you strong. And then the last, your mental state triggers emotional habits through depression. 93% of Americans are dealing with depression this year, after this last year. Everyone, somehow, some way, has been touched by depression. And if you haven't, believe me, you will. Pastor, you shouldn't talk that way. No, it's reality. It's reality, it's a fact. Because you're flesh and blood, I'm flesh and blood. We let our emotions get out of control that develop into habits, and one habit is depression. They say that depression is a disease that, 
don't, don't feel bad about it because it's just a disease. That's what the world says even about alcohol. Don't feel bad, it's a disease. It starts somewhere. You know how you become an alcoholic? Starts with the first sip. Starts somewhere. You know how depression comes your way? Through God saying, you go clean that room and it goes that way. Pride. Depression always starts. Why? How can you say that, Jeff? You know, Pastor Jeff, you're not a psychologist. No, no, I've just lived life. I've fallen in depression before. And it's been because God has told me to go this way and I went this way. And I messed it up. There's that tug of war that the Bible says it's constantly in us. It's called Satan and, and your soul. Satan fighting for your soul. He wants your soul so bad. There's a tug of war, tug of war, tug of war. And this pride that finally sets in and develops the habit of depression. There's Elijah that did an awesome thing. He did an awesome thing on a hill called Mount Carmel. And he won a battle like no other. God showed up like no other. I mean, over 450 Baal worshipers, I mean, they saw God show up. And man, even after that, he was so high on victory, the Holy Spirit came all over him that he became the bionic man. He ran faster to the next city than any chariots. He just passed chariots right and left. He, he, the power of God came all over him. Then all of a sudden, a woman showed up in his life called Jezebel. And Jezebel said, I'm gonna kill you. I'm gonna kill you, Elijah. And Elijah heard those words. This prophet of God heard those words, ran to the wilderness, and fell in depression, the Bible says. Right here in 1 Kings 19.4, while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom bush, sat down under it, prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. I have had enough, God. He fell in depression. Again, God didn't tell him to go to the wilderness. He went on his own. It's called pride. Here he falls in depression because fear stripped all his faith. Bottom line, where are you going to go when God tells you? When God tells you to go here, you going to go there? I'm, a, I'm just God's little pawn. I've, I've always said that. I'm just God's little pawn. I'm God's little robot. I, I will do whatever God wants me to do. I've tried to live my life that way. Messed up a few times, but I've tried to live my life that way. I fell in love with God's will to marry Tammy before I fell in love with Tammy. I want you to know that. I fell in love. I just knew it was God's will. And man, when she flashed those eyes at me too, whoa, that helped. They're beautiful. When finally you're obedient, say, God says, go there, and phew, you go there. Where are you going to go? God's all about your mental state. He's all about your emotions. That, this is very, very critical. Do you realize that every time that Pastor Dave does a youth retreat, they have like 200 kids or more at these youth retreats, that they bring a nurse along on the youth retreat, and the nurse is carrying a huge bag of prescription pills for all the kids. When I was a youth pastor, 
and I would have 120, 130 kids show up to my youth retreats for a whole weekend or a week, no prescription. It was unheard of. What's going on? What direction are you going to go? I just want to walk you through a prayer. It's a prayer of faith. It's a prayer that we just say to our God, Lord, you are in control. Take my life. You don't have to pray this with me, but I encourage the family of the Lord to say this all together so we can encourage everybody that needs to say this. People that are giving their hearts to Jesus Christ, people that are allowing demonic powers to fall off their lives. In this simple little prayer, God shows up and God starts to do work within people's lives. Say this after me. Dear Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my wickedness. Dear Jesus, because of your cross, because of your resurrection, you have given me the authority to speak against these evil things. And so, Lord, I claim it in your awesome name, Jesus Christ, that I'm going to walk your direction and walk for your will to be done in my life. So I give my life to you in your precious name. And everybody said, Amen. Let's give God a glory.